I watched a brand new video that you just po- put out over the weekend, and you you really took a deep dive into our federal debt, uh, our national debt. Can you elaborate on that? Because I remember being a kid, I was like, who cares? You know, the, the, the government's in, they have a deficit and it keeps going up and they keep redoing things. Now it's coming to a it kind of kind of come into a bubble, I think. So what's your take on that? Yeah, so the video that I made, uh, I think the one that you're referencing, um, has to do with what Jamie Dimon, who's a CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, said. So he did a meeting, I believe it was last week, where what he said is that the United States economy is about to drive off of a cliff. And it was a very interesting analogy because what he said was uh, the United States economy is essentially driving at 60 miles an hour, and we see this cliff ahead of us. We don't know exactly how far it is, but he says maybe 10 years away, but we have this cliff coming and we just keep driving towards it. And what he says by that is that the United States government has been spending a lot of money. We have uh, printed a lot of money and all these things have a consequence, which we've been very fortunate not to really have to deal with yet. Now, of course, we said, saw a lot of inflation in 2021 and 2022 and 2023. However, it hasn't created real chaos. And that's what uh, Jamie Dimon in the interview that I was covering was talking about that if people start to really devalue the currency or start to lose trust in the dollar in the United States economy, that this would create chaos, not just in the United States, but in world markets, because we have so many foreign investors keeping their wealth and dollars in the United States dollar. And that was the thing that he was talking about in this interview. And the the real core thing to understand here is that really there's no such thing as free money. In fact, what I like to say is that the most expensive kind of money is free money. Now, the reason why that matters is because the United States government has a 30 plus trillion dollar national debt. Now, what does that mean? Today, it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, it's just a big number thrown up on a screen. But the question people have naturally is, will this national debt ever be a concern? Because what this means is that the United States government is spending money that they don't have. And like you said, the government Mm -hmm. generates their money through taxpayers, through tax dollars. So you and I go to work, uh, we get paid, and the government takes some of that money in taxes. Now, if the government wants to build a road, uh, they have to use these tax dollars to build a road. But if there's not enough tax dollars there in their pot, which there aren't because the United States government has been running this thing called a national deficit, which means they spend more money than what they generate, then they have to do something else to get this money to build a road. Now, the first thing that they can do is say, we are going to impose a 1% tax, a one-time tax on people making over $100 million a year, hypothetically. If they do that and they implement this tax and they get this money and they use this money to build a road, it's very clear who's paying for that road and where that money is coming from. But if the government says, we want to build a road, we don't have the money to do it, we're going to build it anyways without raising taxes. Then they go out and build this road. The question is, who pays for it? And this is where a lot of people are kind of clueless as to how the government pays for it because, well, it's not clear who pays for it. Because what ends up happening now is the government has to finance this road construction. Now, how do they finance this road construction? Either they can go out and borrow money from you and I by issuing treasuries or they can call their friends over at the Federal Reserve Bank, who's a central bank of the United States, and say, hey, can you loan us however many billions of dollars that way we can go out and build this road? Now, the Federal Reserve Bank is not sitting on any cash piles. They're not, they don't have reserves. So what they have to do is then print the money. So now the government then goes out. If they get it from the Federal Reserve Bank, they have to print the money. This money give, gets lent to the United States government, and they then go out and build the roads. Now, the road gets built. It's good for the economy. Construction workers get jobs, and the roads are built. But now the question is, who is paying the price? And the first and most obvious answer is, well, you have to pay this money back. Because when the government borrows money, just like anybody else, have to pay it back plus interest. So that means more of our tax dollars are going to be used to pay back the road. That's the clear and obvious part. And that means everybody's got to pay for it. But the less clear and obvious part is, 
the second cost, what I like to call the hidden cost, the hidden tax, which then comes through inflation. Because what inflation really is, is it is a devaluation of the currency. Because now if the government is printing more and more money through the Federal Reserve Bank, that means each individual dollar has less buying power because now there's more dollars in circulation. And that means each individual dollar has less spending and less buying ability. So that's what then causes inflation. And who does inflation benefit and who does inflation hurt? Well, inflation hurts everybody because it hurts consumers. Every single person, rich people, middle class people, and poor people are consumers. Because when you go to the grocery store and you want to buy your avocados, it's going to cost you more money. When you go to the grocery store, you want to buy eggs, it's going to cost you more money. When you want to pay for rent, it's going to cost you more money. When you want to go on a vacation, it's going to cost you more money. Inflation hurts everybody. But inflation also benefits some people. It benefits the asset owners and the financially educated. Because now when you have inflation, well, if you're a real estate investor, the value of your assets have gone up and your rental rates have also gone up. If you're a stock market investor, inflation means the stores that you own, that you invested in, are charging more money and you're making more money. Inflation means that the investors and the financially educated have made money, but everybody else has gotten hurt through consuming. So now when you think about this, the government has been running a national deficit, meaning spending more money than what they bring in pretty much every year for the last two decades. And so now when you start thinking about this, well, they've been working with the Federal Reserve Bank to print money for decades. And now what does that mean? That means, well, people who understand money have become wealthier versus the people that don't understand money haven't. And that's why today you're starting to see, or not starting, you're seeing even bigger divide between the financially educated and those who are not. People say uh, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the middle class is getting wiped out. And this is why. It's because most people don't understand how the system works. They don't understand how money works. They don't understand how inflation works. They don't understand how investing works because we're never taught these things. But yet our economic system is designed to produce inflation and that disproportionately hurts some people more than others. Long answer to your short question. That's fantastic. And that's what a lot of people just don't get. It's like, you know, why are the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? Because you just don't understand the fundamentals behind this. You know, that's why I get, I go off on a tangent sometimes when I watch some YouTube channels and it's like, you know, the world's going to crash because of this. And, you know, they, you know, and they give you the context behind it that makes really no sense. So that's why I love watching your channel because you just put the fundamentals behind it and, and kind of take it from there. So ex expanding a little bit on that, what Jamie Dimon was saying. So now we have, here's my problem with the stock market right now. I agree 1000% exactly what, you, what you're saying. At what point, you know, you still have the multiples, the PE multiples and everything on, on stocks. It's still kind of in, in range of, you know, it's not really, really overpriced yet. I don't think, but a lot of these companies came back at the beginning of last year and they dropped down their estimates. So now when they're hitting their estimates or exceeding their estimates, it's already on kind of deflated numbers. So I, I'm, I'm not a doom and gloom guy. I'm not a doom and gloom guy when it comes to the economy, when it comes to stocks, when it comes to housing, but I'm, st I'm starting to get a little nervous now. And neither of us are financial planners. We don't have our licenses. We don't, you know, we're not a financial planner. This don't, please, everybody out there, please don't take this as a financial channel. That gets us out of trouble. Um, so, but my, my, my concern now is with all this, it, what you just went over, at what point are stocks going to be, you know, hit that, hit that, that, that cliff, I guess is the best way to say it. Yeah, well, you know, I really like to follow Warren Buffett's advice here, which is just keep buying. Um, I, I, I think, well, here, I know the United States stock market is going to crash. When? I have no idea. Uh, I do. I think we have risks in the economy. 100%. Do I think we have risks to the stock market? 100%. Does that mean I'm not going to invest money? No, absolutely not. Um, I'll tell you what I do. And I don't recommend what I do to anybody else. 
I have a system where every Wednesday, money leaves my checkings account and it's automatically invested into my portfolio of ETFs. So these are things that give me exposure to the broad stock market, to innovation, to emerging markets, the S&P 500 dividends, whatever. Uh, that happens every Wednesday. I don't care if the market's up, if the market's down, I keep buying. The only change that I make is when the market is uh, crashing, I just buy more aggressively. Now, I also have a separate strategy where I'm looking for individual companies to invest in. Now, when I'm investing in individual companies, I want to buy a company at a good price. This one is where now I'm keeping up with what a company is doing. I'm listening to the earnings calls. I'm looking at the financials. And I'm also monitoring the market. So I'm much more involved here. And this is where I think people get confused because many times people are throwing their money into the markets without understanding their strategy. They're looking for the next uh, Amazon, the next Tesla, the next Meta, the next NVIDIA, whatever it might be. And so you're just trying to throw your money into the markets without understanding, number one, what it is that you're investing in. Number two, what is your strategy? Because then if we, if we take a look at history, you take a look at the stock market for the last 100 years, what we've seen is that the United States economy has been through a lot of crap. We went through in the last 100 years, we went through the Great Depression. We went through recession after recession after recession. We went through the great inflation area of the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s. We went through the dot-com bust. We went through the great uh, recession of 2008. We went through the pandemic of 2020. Yet, the stock market is still resilient. Now, what does that mean? We have more crap coming. That does not <laughs> mean that you don't need to be investing. So... You know, even if you invested into the stock market uh, right before the stock market crashed in 2008, you'd still be more profitable today, assuming you held on to the good assets. Now, again, the key here is good assets, because if you bought Sears, well, you would have lost all your money. Yeah. So now how do you identify these good assets? Well, either you got to invest in your financial education, that way you can understand what it is that you're investing in, or B, you invest your money into funds, whether it's ETFs, index funds, mutual funds, they give you exposure to the broader market. So I think a lot of people are trying to time the market without actually understanding the risks and implication of that, uh, where most people should be just trying to own the market for the long term. Yeah, that, you made a great point there, and in, in many of the videos that you post up there, I apologize if if his if Just Breed's videos looks a little bit uh, sketchy right now. So my apologies for that, folks. Um, but you you made a point on a lot of videos that you do. Don't try to time the market, and, and that that I think that's really relative today, because you have I'll I'll, I'll kind of pivot over to real estate. In, in because this is a, a timing market where people are saying the market has to crash uh, and has to crash because it went so far up, it has to crash. But if everybody really knew the dynamics behind it, um, it doesn't have to. You know, it, will there be equilibriums? Yes. Can it crash? Absolutely, it can crash. But just because something went up in value, you know, exponentially, doesn't mean it has to crash. So, what's your take? If we, if you don't mind, if we can pivot to real estate just, just briefly, what's your take on real estate, say 2024, 2025, based on you know what the Federal Reserve's going to do, um, and then you know just the economics behind it. Yeah, I mean, so. Real estate, just like any other asset, depends on supply and demand. On the supply side, we still have a very low supply or inventory of homes uh, available for sale. Yeah. Low inventory of homes keeps home prices high. Uh, on the demand side, demand is high, I mean, but it's not anywhere near as high as it was. Uh, and part of the reason for demand falling has to do with the higher mortgage rates. Now, despite the fact that demand has fallen um, compared to where we were in 2021 and even 2022, home prices are still very high and a lot of neighborhoods still climbing higher. So now if we think about, okay, what's coming in 2024 and 2025, starting with the supply side, uh, will inventory rise? Sure. Inventory will probably rise in 2024 and into 2025. How much? Uh, well, I don't know if anything significant to cause a massive shift in supply. Uh, we don't see a massive rise in foreclosures. Although, if you look at all the statistics, they talk about how foreclosures are skyrocketing. That's yeah. relative to zero foreclosures 
in 2020 to 2022 ish so yeah i yeah. mean compared to zero you have a lot more foreclosures but compared to 2019 uh not that many foreclosures uh now could foreclosures rise yeah that would be a byproduct of economic pain um but we don't have that yet then on the demand side well what is the federal reserve bank going to do i can't predict what they're going to do but they say that they want to cut interest rates, ideally sometime in 2024. Now, no one knows what they're going to do. Uh, Jerome Powell in his most recent meeting said that he's not cutting them in, in March, maybe May. Uh, he spoke on 60 Minutes uh, just yesterday and kind of hinted that maybe the second half of 2024, nobody knows what he's going to do. Nobody knows if and when he's going to cut interest rates and to what extent. But let's go with that assumption that they cut interest rates a few times in 2024. You got to remember that the Federal Reserve Bank raised interest rates 11 times uh, between 2022 and now. So if they raise it 11 times and they cut it three times, that means interest rates are still going to be high, maybe a little bit lower than where we are today. If interest rates are a little bit lower than where we are today, what is that going to do? Well, if mortgage rates fall to well, let's start with this. Let's assume mortgage rates fell to 3% tomorrow. What would happen? Everybody, their moms, their sisters, and their cousins are going to go out and want to buy a home again, and your phones are going to be ringing off the hook uh, yeah. because everyone's going to be calling you for a mortgage, uh, yeah. which means that a home listed for sale for $500,000 is going to be getting more bidding wars, and people are going to pay $625,000 for that half a million dollar home because that's what the market is today. There's a lot of pent-up demand. Now, what will it be like in six months? I have no idea. But if the market stays like what it is today and mortgage rates start to fall, the the belief is that it's going to wake up a lot of dormant potential buyers who will want to go out and buy a home, which could push home prices up. But see, the thing here is Jerome Powell isn't stupid as much as people want to claim that he is. Uh, he is an intelligent person. And... I would assume and I hope that he understands how home prices impact inflation. And so the reason why Jerome Powell has been raising interest rates and keeping interest rates high up until now is to cool off inflation. Well, if you start cutting interest rates today, obviously the inflation problem is going to get worse because more people are going to go out to buy homes. But what Jerome Powell is kind of predicting and weighing is cool down in the economy versus inflation because higher interest rates have an impact on our economy. This is a fact. Have we really felt the impact of it? No, not really. I mean, unemployment is at 3.7%, some of the lowest numbers we have seen in decades. But this is where Jerome Powell has said and made it very clear that he is expecting unemployment to rise and kind of needs unemployment to rise. He's talked about how he wants to see the labor market soften. What that means is he wants to see people lose their jobs. Um, now, while that sounds harsh, his reasoning is we need to have a little bit of a cooler economy because we don't want this economy to overheat and uh, cause more inflationary issues. Now, let's think about that. If Jerome Powell now, on one hand, wants to cut interest rates, but on the other hand, is predicting the slowdown in the economy. The question is, when is each of these going to happen? And we don't know. My thoughts, and again, these are just my thoughts, are we have to keep interest rates higher for longer in order to bring down the inflation problem. Because if we cut interest rates tomorrow, we already know what's going to happen with home prices. We know what's going to happen with buying and spending, and that's going to cause more inflationary issues. The inflationary issue is a much bigger concern than a potential economic slowdown because we know how to stimulate the economy out of an economic slowdown. We don't know how to fix an inflation crisis. We don't know how to fix a currency crisis, and it's not as easy. So that's why, for me, I would rather see interest rates stay higher for longer as a way to cool down inflation, as a way to cool down price growth that way people can actually start building more wealth because if home prices start to skyrocket, 
yeah, that's good for homeowners, but for everybody that's not a homeowner, that hurts them. It hurts people's ability to build wealth because an asset price is soar, which is good for asset owners, but for the rest of America, they get left out of the of the game. And at a time where inflation, is, yeah, it has fallen, but inflation is still high and people's incomes are still not necessarily keeping up with inflation. Well, you got to remember, the inflation that we're seeing today is on top of the 2023 inflation. It's on top of the 2022 inflation. It's on top of the 2021 inflation. And people's incomes have not kept up year over year. So the prices of things have risen faster than incomes. And if you start cutting interest rates, the inflation problem gets worse, which means the prices of things could be rising again while incomes are not keeping up. And we know what that looks like. And that's not something that we want as a country. Right. And that's what I, I noticed the last the last few times the Federal Reserve met. And guys, my apologies again about Just Spreet's video quality. Uh, we'll try to get that fixed. But um, here's here's my take on on a lot of this. And the Fed's in a really tough situation because I keep saying I think a lot of the data is starting to come in that they are showing cracks in the foundation. The, the jobs numbers still blow my mind. It's like one, ADP comes out with this number, and then uh, two days later the, the the government comes out with their numbers. ADP's numbers just don't seem to jive a lot of times. Um, but you're starting to see some cracks in the foundation. The, the, the concern I have is the Federal Reserve, I mean, they've, every time they've basically signaled or, or, or you know, opened up their hand a little bit, they're, they're playing cards to us, and they said you know, that we might you know, reduce rates or whatever, the stock market goes up instantaneously that day like 1%. So if they actually physically came out and said, yep, we're going to cut because inflation is right in check, my biggest concern is kind of like what you were saying. You're going to see the stock market rally. You're going to see more mortgage rates plummet. People are just going to go back in full force once again, and we're going to be back in the same dilemma that we we're, we're kind of currently in or we're, we're just coming out of. So what, I, I guess I this is an area that confuses the heck out of me. What do they do? Just continue to you know keep rates up there, um, just to kind of combat this as long as long as they possibly can, or do they really need to see the the unemployment rate just spike? Because I say it all the time too. The federal the federal uh, reserve basically wants you to lose your job so you don't have a job. You're not making money to buy stuff. So it's like kind of a you're chasing your tail. But I I, have, I feel bad for the federal reserve because it's like what do you do? You know, again, if you yeah. even hint you're going to reduce rates, the markets go nuts. Yeah, I, I don't feel bad for the Federal Reserve because I, I think, well, no, I don't think. The reason why yeah. we're in this mess is because of the Federal Reserve to begin with. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's the money printing and, and quantitative easing measures that caused the inflation and the problems which kind of created this predicament. So I don't feel bad for them for that. However, I do think that now fighting the inflation problem is tough. And yeah. I, I would agree that, you know, that is a tough measure for them where you're right. I, I, I think, or at least I hope they understand that, yeah. you know, fighting inflation, it's tricky because on one hand, they want to keep the economy booming. I mean, it's an election year in 2024. Yeah. You have to anticipate that there's some pressure on them uh, to keep the economy strong and to keep unemployment low. In addition to that, you have kind of what you're talking about with the stock market. Now, one thing that I do want to just mention on the stock market is, is at least say the old Wall Street uh, saying, which is, buy the rumor, sell the news. And uh, what what that means is now when it comes to interest rates. There's a lot of rumors about interest rates being cut. And what you generally see is people get excited about the idea of interest rates get cut um, because that's kind of the rumor. And then once the news happens, well, everybody already knows about it and how much more room is there, right? Because the stock market is all emotional and it's based off of what people think is going to happen in the economy. And by the time you hear about potential interest rate cuts coming, people have generally already priced in the interest rate cuts. So that's one thing that I would like to caution people about, which is why I'm not a fan or advocate of trying to time the market. Um, so yeah, I do think it's a tough balance, but they have to balance the economy with inflation and I hope they understand the issues that inflation can cause if it doesn't get solved sooner rather than later.
Yeah. And then you start seeing a lot of the, because it's an election year, you start seeing a lot of the politicians jockeying for those votes. So it's like, well, let's give this to that group and let's give this to that group and let's give this to that yeah. group, but we don't have the money to give, you know, that that's the biggest concern I have. And you know, when this, when this, this bubble's going to burst, who knows? Um, uh, but, um, so, I, I can't thank you enough. I, I've taken enough of your time today. So I, I just wanted to cover what your thoughts are on the, the Fed, because I think we share basically the same views on a lot of this stuff, you know, in the economy and what they're going to do in the stock market and the real estate market. And just, you know, keep doing what you're doing, buddy, because your, your, your education to those that just, you know, like, like you were saying before, it's the wealthier getting wealthier because they understand the game. And then the, the poor are getting unfortunately poor because they don't know how the game's played. And that's what I, I, I find in you. And that's why I, I was attracted to your channel and I've reached out to you and, and I can't be, I can't thank you enough for joining us, you know, on here and just giving your, your context out there. Because again, there's so many people out there that just, you know, they give these contexts of, you know, this is going to do, this is going to blow up and that's going to blow up. And this is, and, but, but why? And then that's what I always try to explain on my channel why and what's going on behind the scenes that you guys need to know so um thank you so much again tell everybody that on my channel they they hopefully they better know who you are and what you are because i talk about you so much but explain to everybody what what do you do what do you, what does your company actually do sure well again thank you for the kind words Dan. you you are yeah. awesome and and i really thank do you. appreciate that i really really do um yeah, so my name is Jaspreet Singh. Uh, I'm the host of a show called Minority Mindset on YouTube. A lot of people know me for that, uh, where I talk about what's happening either in financial news or financial education. But what's interesting is I like to call my YouTube channel my hobby um, because my my quote unquote full time job is uh, I run a company called Briefs Media, and Briefs Media is a financial news and education platform. Uh, we have a free newsletter called Market Briefs, where my team breaks down what's happening. Uh, in the financial news six days a week. Uh, it's a free newsletter. You can read in less than five minutes every morning. Uh, we have a paid newsletter for people who want a more in-depth breakdown of what's happening in the macroeconomic side of things called Market Briefs Pro. Uh, we also have an education platform called Briefs Academy, where uh, if somebody wants to learn more about financial education, whether it be money management, stock market investing, real estate investing, understanding the science of a recession and things like that, uh, we have all of that in Briefs Academy. So yeah, I guess that's what I do uh, in a nutshell. <laughs> and you do a fantastic job at it. And I, I mean, this young man, you can see him on CNN and CNBC and all over the place. So for him to, to kind of stoop down and, and help out a, a little channel like myself, dude, I, I, I'm grateful. So thank you oh, so Dan, much. You're crushing it, man. Thank you so much as usual. I hope we can do this every once in a while. I know you got a busy schedule, but I, I truly, truly appreciate your feedback, buddy. So thanks. Thanks so much. And again, I hope to have you on your hair another time that you can help kind of explain your markets uh, to my my channel. So thanks appreciate again so it, much. Man. Thank take you, it Dan. easy. Buddy. All right. Take yeah. care. Bye-bye. It is a cliff. We see the cliff. It's about 10 years out. We're going 60 miles an hour. It's the most predictable cliff. crisis we've ever it, had. Exactly. Now, I've already spent the time going through the entire interview, and I'm going to break it down for you here. But if you want to watch the interview for yourself, I will link it for you down in the description. But one of the things that Jamie Dimon talks about is he compares the economy today to the